Baby, don't you know that I'll never, ever, never, ever, never, ever give up Not until the end of time And darling, don't you see you're the only one, the only one, the only one for me And I'll be waiting till you're mine ta da ba da 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 ta da 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 Welcome to the lecture of love Yesterday we are going to speak about the fusion of the male and the female gamete to form a zygote and that is exactly what the definition of fertilization is. Ah, how romantic. So fertilization can be defined as the process of fusion of the male and female haploid gametes to form a diploid zygote and the commonest site of this is the ampulla of the uterine tube, a commonly asked question. Now from here onwards, we're going to classify the lectures into time zones. So considering fertilization as day zero, we're going to go to day seven. So by the end of this lecture, we'll have reached the beginning of implantation, but not the end of implantation. All right. So we already saw that the sperms had left from the seminiferous tubules and reached the epididymis. And that is where they gain motility. Now as they traverse further into the male genital tract, there are some other secretions that are added from the prostate, the seminal vesicles and the bulbourethral glands and all these to a certain extent help in making the sperm motile and also giving it some energy. And during coitus, it essentially enters through the vaginal canal into the cervix. Now most of the sperms can't make it all the way there. So out of about 200 to 300 million sperms that have been released, about 300 to 500 eventually reach till the ampullary end of the uterine tube. Okay, there are so many factors like pH, prostaglandins, things that you'll have to read about on your own. Okay, now what we need to talk about though is that this little boy does not really become a man until he reaches the female genital tract because that is where a process known as capacitation occurs. Now I've mentioned it in the last lecture. It's essentially the conditioning or the training of a sperm to become, you know, a true man, <laughs> for lack of a better word. And if we were to talk about it in a scientific format, you could just call it epithelial interactions. You don't need to get into the detail, but what happens is epithelial interactions between the glycoproteins of the cell membranes of the sperm, and the surrounding environment because of which it really becomes good in doing its job. It has become a trained soldier. The process takes approximately seven hours. Okay. Now, fertilization can be divided into phases. And phase number one is penetration of the corona radiator. So, about 300 to 500 sperms that have reached over here are now going to fight with the cells of the corona radiator. How do they do that? Well, we do understand what the acrosomal cap is, right? So this is the condensed nucleus, this is the acrosomal cap and this is the cell membrane over it. So there is a contact that is made between the outer acrosomal membrane and the cell membrane and this is how acrosomal enzymes are released. These are proteolytic enzymes. The most important enzyme in fighting the corona radiator and dissolving it is Hyaluronidase, okay, hyaluronidase. Now, all these sperms are releasing this hyaluronidase enzyme and helping in the dissolving of the corona radiata. But essentially, it is only one sperm who makes it all the way to the next barrier. And what is the next barrier? Yes, the next barrier is in red over here, and that is the zona pellucida, okay. So when the head of the sperm makes contact with the zona pellucida, there are two things that take place. The first thing is the acrosomal reaction. Okay. What is the acrosomal reaction? It is 
just a further release of acrosomal enzymes that are brought about by an interaction with the ZP3 ligand, it's just a protein on the cell membrane, don't need to get into the details, of the zona pellucida because of which the sperm head is burying inside the zona pellucida and thus dissolving it. Okay, the most important enzyme over here is known as acrosin. Okay, so because of acrosin, the head of the sperm has now dissolved into the zona pellucida, but it has two further barriers, right? Zona pellucida, after dissolving, the sperm still has to cross the perivital line space, which you can see over here, and the cell membrane of the oocyte. Correct? So, this is where we come across the next kind of reaction, which is known as the zona reaction. What exactly is the zona reaction? Well, when the head of the sperm makes contact with the zona pellucida, there is an activation of certain mechanisms which we do not need to get into the details of, but the overall output of that is the inactivation of the species specific receptors. What does that mean? That means that no other sperm can actually start digging into the zona pellucida because the chemical configuration of the zona pellucida undergoes a change. Okay? Inactivation of species specific receptors. Alright? See if we can have a better look by looking at this slide over here. Now, if you observe this carefully, you can see that the zona pellucida has been dissolved at this point. Right? And now, when you see what happens over here is that the other sperm is not being able to contact right it's basically being rejected or excluded and this is happening because there is a change in the nature of the zona pellucida because of the zona reaction now after crossing the perivital line space the next thing that the sperm head comes in contact with is the cell membrane of the oocyte itself and that's where you come across another reaction which is known as the cortical reaction. What is the cortical reaction? The cortical reaction is the fusion of all these cortical granules that you can see in yellow and then they releasing whatever proteolytic enzymes they have accumulated inside them in the perivital line space. And what happens because of that? is that the oocyte membrane also becomes absolutely impermeable to any further sperm contact. This is what prevents polyspermy. So the cortical reaction and the zona reaction essentially are reactions that make the secondary oocyte unavailable for any more sperms. That's the basis of it all. Okay? Now, there is also a calcium depolarization that occurs and that contributes to the very same phenomenon. So different textbooks have mentioned all these different mechanisms and you could just probably remember the names of them and not the details. Okay, so we finished phase one that was piercing the corona radiata or dissolving it. We finished phase two that was piercing the zona pellucida and also reaching the next barrier that is the plasma membrane of the oocyte and finally phase 3 is the fusion of the cell membrane of the sperm and the oocyte okay so if you observe carefully there's a fusion that has happened over here between the cell membrane of the sperm and the oocyte and what is gone inside is the head and the tail and a very important MCQ that you need to remember is the mitochondria, which is slightly strange because they were in the middle piece, right? But the mitochondria are not really involved in the formation of the zygote. So it's completely the maternal mitochondria that are inherited by the zygote. Okay, that's a very important question. It's asked multiple times. Let's move on to the effects of fertilization. Okay, do remember that this meeting of the cell membrane of ovum and sperm also has a lot of epithelial interactions. Now different textbooks mention different things. The best way to put it is that the disintegrin in the cell membrane of the sperm interacts with the integrin on the cell membrane of the oocyte. Okay? Now, 
the effects of fertilization point number 1 completion of meiosis 2 of the secondary oocyte if you saw the previous lecture you know that the secondary oocyte is stuck in metaphase 2 of meiosis 2 and it undergoes completion only once fertilization occurs so it is all these reactions and primarily the calcium depolarization that helps in completing this metaphase 2 so that the second polar body is extruded outside as you can see here and now you've got a haploid chromosomal content of 22 plus x which slightly starts becoming a little more enveloped and a little more constricted to form what is known as the female pronucleus okay at the same time the head of the sperm that has entered now starts swelling up a little and attains the same size of the female pronucleus which is known as the male pronucleus now this could either be a 22 plus x if it's an x bearing sperm or it could be a 22 plus y depending on either of these two the zygote could either be a male zygote or a female zygote so after completion of meiosis 2 what happens is the restoration of diploidy so now you've got 44 plus xx or 44 plus xy and determination of sex depending on whether it was the x bearing sperm or y bearing sperm so there's restoration of diploidy and sex determination okay the next thing that happens is the initiation of cleavage divisions now what are cleavage divisions well once the male and the female pronucleus come close to each other their nuclear envelopes dissolve and they arrange themselves along the metaphase equator now this does not happen unless there is dna replication remember these were all haploid with a certain amount of dna now that dna has to be doubled which means that a chromatid that look like that ends up looking like the typical x shaped chromatid and then these arrange as axes along the equator so that there is centromere splitting and you can see the anaphase happening over here so male pronucleus female pronucleus come close together nuclear envelopes dissolve dna replication is going on dna amount is doubled a typical x chrome x shaped sorry not x typical x shaped chromosome is formed that aligns along the equator and there is centromere splitting and you directly reach what is known as the two cell stage now this is the first division of cleavage so what happens in fertilization is that there can never actually be a one cell stage so there is the union of male and female pronuclei and then there is an immediate let's call it mitosis that leads to a two cell stage so these mitotic divisions are known as cleavage divisions and the only difference between a typical mitosis and cleavage is that as cleavage divisions keep occurring every cell becomes smaller and smaller in size so this is your two cell stage this happens approximately 30 hours after fertilization then there is a four cell stage at approximately 40 hours and then you reach the 12 to 16 cell stage which is also known as the morula in approximately 3 days and then the late morula stage in 4 days and now all these little cells are known as blastomeres now please bear in mind that the blastomeres are still surrounded by the zona pellucida why because these blastomeres have an irritating quality of wanting to burrow in the endometrium and as far as the zona pellucida is there it is going to prevent implantation from happening so about the 6th day is when the zona pellucida disappears or you can say that the structure hatches out of the zona pellucida what structure this structure the morula or the 16 cell stage all these cells are known as blastomeres and around the 6th day the zona pellucida hatches and the 
blastocyst as it is known is ready for implantation and by the time that happens of course there is a couple of changes happening in the blastocyst as well firstly from the 16 cell stage there is an appearance of a cavity as you can see over here and this is known as the blastoseal or the blastocyst cavity and the appearance of cavity is also characterized by one more thing some of the cells accumulate in a certain region and become tightly bound to each other, a process known as compaction. It's basically the establishment of tight intercellular junctions between them. And the other bunch of cells become slightly flattened and are surrounding the blastocystic cavity. Now, this compacted region is known as the inner cell mass and this region is known as the outer cell mass and it is to be remembered that it is the inner cell mass that leads to the embryo proper and the outer cell mass that eventually is called as the trophoblast that leads to the formation of the placenta okay so the inner cell mass forms the embryo proper and what we shall be studying in the next lecture is what exactly happens with the inner cell mass. While the journey of the trophoblastic layer will be considered in a separate chapter in placenta. Okay, now remember that we have reached around day 7 when implantation just begins. You can see over here that the trophoblastic cells are literally invading inside the uterine epithelium. This is again because of certain... Uh, enzymes that are secreted which are proteolytic and there is also another interaction which is known as integrin interactions, selectin interactions, fibronectin, all these little different molecules that help in the entire process of the implantation. So this seems like an amazing way to summarize what we've done so far. Okay, At the 14th day of the menstrual cycle ovulation occurred and the secondary oocyte along with the corona radiata cells was discharged right that's point number one now over here you can see the act of fertilization happening at the ampullary end okay and this happens about 12 to 24 hours after ovulation if the sperm does not come this basically just regresses on its own the secondary oocyte that has been uh, ruptured and thrown out right now at point number three we have the stage of the male and the female pronuclei okay and at point number four over here we have the mitotic spindle that is characteristic of the first cleavage division okay the two cell stage that is seen approximately 30 hours later okay you can see that here then in about three days we've got more cleavage divisions and at point number seven at four days you can see that a morula is formed. It's a 16 cell stage. Then at about the fifth day, the cavity or the blastoseal has appeared. Okay, that's also the point where the zona pellucida has disappeared. So now we are almost ready for implantation. Okay, by about the end of the sixth day, you can see how the trophoblastic cells have started invading inside the endometrium. Okay, and what you see in light blue color is the inner cell mass that has undergone compaction and is ready to form the embryo proper okay so this is a uh, slide showing the actual photographs uh, from a mouse embryo uh, these are pictures from Langman's 13th edition very beautiful pictures you can see millions of sperms trying to get inside over here you can see the male and the female pronuclei arranging themselves this is the two cell stage of the zygote then this is the loosely arranged inner cell mass and this is after compaction occurs you can see how they've come closer to each other by the formation of intercellular tight junctions and this is the inner cell mass the blastoseal and the flattened outer cell mass which is about to form the trophoblast and later the placenta and the inner cell mass which is going to give rise to the embryo proper all right Thank you for listening. Now, I want you to obviously do some things on your own, like abnormal gametes, what is fluorescent in situ hybridization, what is intracytoplasmic sperm injection. These are some really interesting concepts that 
uh, are a part of genetics and if you want I can add a couple of those notes in my Google Classroom but I really want you to read these things on your own. Uh, next we are going to discuss what happens from day 7 to day 14. That is the second week of embryogenesis. Take care, study every day, bye bye.